All right, so this is going to be the first in a series of lectures, um, the which I would normally give in an intro to geology class, so like your geology 101 type class. Um, but since the pandemic, I really haven't been working and I haven't been teaching, which is kind of a bummer to me. Um, so I just thought I would do these like this. This is basically sort of an open available way that if you are curious about geology and you want to hear about it from a weird autistic you know lady then this is the place to hear about it I like to think that I'm funny um, but you can be the judge of that anyways without further ado so this is me that's my face my name is Clarissa um, and or I am sometimes known as the rock doc this was my graduation when I got my master's degree at WSU um, and my primary focus is volcanoes, volcanology. Um, I especially work in systems that are what we call mafic, which is, think of like Iceland or Hawaii, those kind of places where there's lots of lava coming out, lots of weird gases, but they're not really big explosions. Um, but I also sort of dabble in the other systems because everything is connected in geology. Um, I am working on my PhD. I am what's called all but dissertation or ABD as we like to abbreviate it. So I will have my doctorate very, very soon, hopefully by the end of next spring. Um, and then this little guy I just love to share. This is a picture of one of the samples that I was working with. Um, this is done under a secondary electron microscope we use as part of the electron microprobe. Um, which I'll explain, you know, in a much later video how that works because it's really kind of cool and it involves bouncing radiation through crystals and then measuring uh, all this stuff. But one of the things that we can do is we can take these really, 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 really close up images. And if you look, you know, down here, you can see that that bar is 10 micrometers. So that's 10 to the negative, I want to say ninth. Yeah, ninth. Um, meters. That's so, it's like smaller than a hair. It's really, 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 really fine. So we can see these really tiny details. And in my world, these circles here are just like gigantic. And this is just unspeakable. But I always thought it kind of looked like it was a screaming face, like it was just terrified or something, which seems to be fitting to what happens in grad school. Um, for those of you nerdy enough to want to know what these are, um, the minerals that we're seeing here are what we're seeing here. This is a, um, pyroxene, uh, probably augite. This darker gray over here is going to be plage, which is uh, plagioclase feldspar. It um, has a lot of calcium in it, um, silicon aluminum. And then all of this, this gray stuff around it is just what we call glass, or sometimes you'll call it glassy mesostasis. Uh, basically, this is lava that froze so fast it didn't have time to create crystals, um, which tells us its own little story, right? And there's there's a huge story behind these that I'll give you an entire lecture on that once I finish it. Um, but we were looking at these to try and find because we were trying to find gases that were in the melt before it erupted, right? So anyways, pressure vessels. Um, but so to kind of start, we want to say what is geology because this is geology 101 right and the reason i'm doing this lecture series incidentally is because i had somebody comment on my clarissa explains everything post about what we were looking for in terms of volcanoes and i just felt like i couldn't answer that question without this primer where oh excuse me <laughs> i'm just gonna do that naturally right um without understanding sort of the basics that lead up to it so We'll start with the geology and we'll actually do this in the order roughly that I would do it in class anyways. Um, and these are the slides that I typically use. Hopefully nobody's going to get on me about copyrights. Obviously you can see a lot of this, um, the images are from Pearson. Um, hopefully this falls under fair use. It's not like I'm trying to do anything, you know, to abuse their stuff. I just want to teach. So, um, so what is geology? So geology is really all about the way that the planet works, how it works, why it works, you know, what's going on. Um, we look at, you know, if you're going to build a new home, I love this question down here, the second one, you know, if you're in Washington around Mount Rainier, or do you want to be in South Dakota, what are the hazards of those locations that are just inherent to the location? Um, I got into trouble over something 
like this guy right here when I was an undergraduate. Why does Washington have more volcanoes than Kansas? And um, <laughs> the reason I got into trouble over this was because I, I was born in Kansas, but I grew up um, in Portland and, you know, on the West Coast. And I still live on the West Coast. And that's like my heart is on the West Coast. Um, so I have always grown up with a tectonically active, and we'll get into what that means, um, you know, region. So volcanic volcano planning and safety is like is is a no brainer to me, right? But um, people who live on the east coast and down southeast, they never experience that. They have their own bevy of problems, right? Sinkholes being one of them. Oh. Um, hurricanes, right? What's going on right now? As I record this, there's been devastation from a hurricane. Um, but so we were talking. It we were in. I was in a. Um, environmental geochemistry class and the instructor was from i want to say louisiana she was from the southeast right way down south um and she said something to the tune of the politicians in louisiana had been questioning why the country was funding research on volcanoes and I started laughing and I said, well, it's Louisiana and the look she gave me. And I said, what? They don't have volcanoes down there. How would they know? <laughs> I was genuine. I was genuinely not trying to be like a little butthead. Um, but, you know, I, autistic people say things that don't always click with everybody else all the time. Like if that was the title of my novel, that's not what I meant. That would be the title of it. Just that's not what I meant. <laughs> uh, but I was just, you know. But it was funny. She was a really good natured. She was she was pretty funny about it actually. We had a good time. I make this habit of pausing and taking a drink after slides because I'm used to teaching this in a lecture hall where students are taking notes. And so I, I instinctively look up from the computer and look around the room like I'm waiting to see when pencils are done moving. So forgive that. It'll give you time to process. Anyways, what is geology? Like, geology is just the science of the earth, its processes, its materials, everything about it that isn't alive. And if it's alive, we only really care about it if it's been dead for, like, a million years or so. Um, we have two general categories, and then they break down a little bit more after that, and I'll get into why that is. Um, physical geology, which is the study of what is right now, like, actually looking at it. And then historical geology, which is using what we can see in that to try and figure out what happened in the past. And then this one, the physical geology, can be broken down into sort of surface processes and um, more of a geochemical look. So we'll look at all of that stuff. Um, it's the science and history of everything on the earth. And what's really kind of neat, one of the things that really appeals to me about the science is the scale is everything. It's everything. You can go from, you know, over here we've got this crystal lattice. We're looking at micro, like, atoms in there. Over here we're looking, you know, in the bottom left we have this crystal seen under a microscope. But it, there's even glass in the background. So this is a tiny crystal. It's not very big. Volcanoes, beaches, the entire planet. I mean, we cover everything. So we get to sort of try and make that all come together and make sense as one thing. Why do these tiny scale things cause these large scale things and back and forth, you know? So it's, it's about patterns and connections. We try to understand how the earth evolved and we try and think in the different time scales. And one of the things that really struck me when I was an undergraduate and I was on a trip to Utah, we were down in um, southern Utah around Moab, which is amazing and you should go. But remember, don't bust the crust. We'll get to what that means later. Um, but if you go to Moab, don't bust the crust, right? Don't do it. Uh, <laughs> but I was standing on Dead Horse Point, actually, which is a state park. It sounds horrible, right? But it has the most, it has the most iconic view of the Colorado River and the Big Gooseneck, which is this big tight turn. Um, and we'll see pictures of that when we get into streams. And I was looking off in the distance and I saw this kind of hummock. Because a lot of the area out there is very flat. You know, it all uplifted as a package, which is kind of cool. But I see this dome and I said, well, what is that over there? And my professor said, oh, that's, I, I want to say, upheaval dome. It's about five miles across. And I was like, 
holy crap, you know, because it was so far away. I mean, it, it was way, 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 way away. And we could see all the way over there. And it was just this little hummock to me. And that was kind of the moment that the scale of everything, you know, hit me really just bopped me in the face. And it was kind of cool. Um, we try to, you know, look at these corollaries between stuff. So we have an active system here on the right with the dunes that are actually moving. But then if you look on the left, what you'll find is potentially there might be patterns that are similar to that. So are they connected? And in this case, it's actually not true, but um, it does kind of look that way. There are lots of jobs in geology and geologists tend to be well employed um, and make very good money. Academia, of course, um, which is where I would prefer to be doing it, but you know, the, them's the cards. Um, economic is where the money is at and you know, petroleum especially, but also metals and coal. There's this um, platinum mine, mine in Montana called the Stillwater Complex, and it is just incredible. And they're doing platinum and palladium and, you know, related things to that. It used to be a chromium mine. And when we get to that stuff, I'll talk about that. But anyways, um, we do a lot of environmental mitigation and we work in hazards assessments. Uh, which I'll show you here in a minute. Now, one of the stories I like to tell about the uh, whole petroleum thing is when I got to go to one of their short courses, which was also sort of like an interview. And it was just like the way that petroleum woos geologists is just incredible. Like it was three, I want to say two nights, three days. They put us up at a very nice hotel. They fed us at least two meals a day, um, like really nice restaurants with, you know, really nice wine and beer and they took us out every night and, and, you know, it was amazing. It was the most fun I'd had in just forever. And it was like a job interview too. And that was great. And then you would go in and you would spend the whole day working through these different sample problems and talking about the different formations and just kind of, you know, being there, um, it, they're, but they're serious. They don't spare expenses. I mean, they're bringing people in there. It's cool. It's really kind of neat, but, you know, and there's pros and cons to the oil and gas industry. They can be really awful environmentally speaking, but it's not always like that. And some companies try more than others. Now, another reason to study geology or, or a reason to study geology, not another reason, I'm getting myself backwards in these slides. I've done them so many times is it can be a lot of fun, right? This is, um, I want to say this is in southern Idaho, um, and these are going to be the rhyolites, but, you know, we go kayaking down the rivers. I, you know, hike into my locations. We do ATVs. We do dirt bikes, whatever it takes to get in there. Um, and then we just are all over the place. We get to play around in places like Yellowstone, and you can go places in Yellowstone that nobody else gets to go if you're there as a geologist doing a study, uh, because we know what not to do, basically, in the park and how not to get ourselves in trouble. Although that can be questionable. Depends on the individual, right? Um, this is a guy I went to grad school with. Um, he has, I believe, finished and gone off to be amazing. Oh, he works in mines, I want to say. Um, and he's, this is actually the guy that I got a lot of these slides from. So cheers to you. If you want to be identified and actually see this, let me know and I'll give your name credit, you know, because this was really cool work. Um, they were working on heat flux. I believe this is the one of the projects with Dr. Larson, um, at these different calderas by way of the water. And so they were putting like these ion doped, uh, water in and then measuring temperature differences. It was really cool. Um, other people playing around on active lava flows, which I desperately want to be this person right here. And I'm pretty sure my husband would lock me in the attic if I tried. So I'm not allowed to do that. <clears throat> or he'd cry one or the other, you know, um, this is some of the places you can go. Um, I did a lot of my work in places like, you know, the one in the top right, we camped the whole time and it's just gorgeous. You spend the whole summer out in the woods doing all that stuff. And then you come back and play in the lab in the winter. Another reason to study geology is that it can save your life. Like quite legitimately, especially if you live in places that are tectonically active or, you know, places that might have sinkholes. There's a lot of ways that that can be really important. So here in the Seattle Times, and this is in 2001, 
Um, there was a sizable earthquake, about a 6.8. Now, just a couple days ago, there was, a, I want to say, a 6.1 in New Zealand. So not a lot smaller than this. Not that much. I mean, it's by tens. So it is considerably smaller, but not hugely smaller. But this is, if you can't tell, this is a vehicle sitting here that has been just crushed by these bricks that fell off. And there's two gents standing here, you know. Yay, I survived. I wasn't in the car when this happened. Thank goodness. Um, and they were very lucky that they were not injured. Because, I mean, this was the kind of thing that was happening was these brick facings were falling off of buildings, chunk of concrete just coming crashing down. Mm, you don't want to get into that, right? You don't want to die. So, oh, here's that picture again, but in color. I didn't even realize I had it twice. Um, but yeah, I mean, they could have been in that vehicle and they were lucky that they weren't. Um, sidewalks get destroyed and disrupted. We saw a lot of that. And when we talk about earthquakes, we'll see a lot of really cool pictures for this as well. Um, this was in Japan, which is prone to earthquakes quite a bit because it's basically one giant volcano. Um, well, multiple volcanoes. Anyways, um, and this was an overpass. And I mean, there were cars on that. People died and that's really tragic. So we want to be aware of these hazards so that we can engineer for them or choose not to build in certain locations, which I took a geology hazards class when I was in undergraduate. And one of the things I always thought was, we should really just call this class stupid things people do and why you shouldn't build there. Because a lot of times the correct answer is don't build there. We still do it. We work with engineers, geological engineers, and look for safe places to build structures. I mean, you don't want to build your house in a place that's going to do that all the time, right? You don't want it to be underwater because then it's ruined. Um, you don't want your property line and fence line to have been right here and a bunch of it just, you know, fell off. I mean, nobody wants that. Um, we also do a lot of environmental cleanup. The Hanford site, which is where the atomic bombs were created. Mm -hmm. It's not a great, you know, legacy. But now, these days, um, it's the site of a whole bunch of environmental cleanup. It's been pretty cool, actually, because I've worked down there a couple of times in different capacities, actually not related to that cleanup. Um, I was doing this carbon sequestration thing. But they do a lot of work out there to clean up what was done in the past. And there's a museum in Richland, Washington, totally worth stopping at. For an hour or two, you know, if you're driving through, it's called the Reach Museum. And it really takes you back to the time when the Hanford site first, site first was formed um, and created and why and what was going on. And it's just kind of a neat story. Um, we do a lot of work in groundwater. That's another one of ours. Um, and the uh, asbestos identification and removal, we actually are trained to identify asbestos very quickly um, so that we can um, help people, you know, decide if they want to get rid of this insulation or not. Um, we do exercises with that, which is pretty cool. Uh, and of course, if it isn't grown, it has to be mined. The um, petroleum products, obviously, which include natural gas, petroleum, right, gasoline, we call it gas, which makes no sense because it's a liquid. Uh, plastics and a lot of these like synthetic products are the result of petroleum um, mining or extractions. We use it for all sorts of things. We need metals for a lot of things. Obviously, gold, silver, platinum, all metals have to be mined. Coal, which we use for energy, which is bad. But we're working on getting away from that. We'll talk about that later. Um, and then the rare earth elements, which are really important in things like wind turbines and your car or your phone. And this is just sort of an example, again, a Pearson page um, of some of the rare earth elements like europium, yttrium, cerium. Um, we've got lanthanum over here, zirconium, neodymium for the magnets because they need a lot of them. Praseodymium, diasporium, terbium, all of these things, because that's how you get the really strong magnets, is because these elements being really weird elements, by the way, um, like they're all their own little freak show. That's why we call them rare earth elements, because they, they were originally very rare because of their weird behavior, but now we know what to look for. Um, we also have a lot of social and political issues in geology, so you'll have political boundaries like the Rio Grande, 
which is the boundary between the U.S. and Mexico. Although it moves sometimes, and so sometimes it isn't. Um, both the Alps, the Himalayans, the Caucasus, all these mountains form borders. Um, natural resources are constantly a point of political and legal strife. We fight over it all the time. I mean, just look at what's going on in the Middle East. We're fighting over oil a lot of the time when we're looking at that neck of the woods, because that's a big resource over there that we want. Um, you know, and we're always looking for new sources of things that are really important, like these rare earth minerals. Okay, now the political consequence, because they're at the bottom of the Pacific, which is international waters, we have to, you know, come to agreements with people over whose minerals are there. Are they, you know, who's allowed to mine there? Who's allowed to take stuff from that oh. area? Oh, the cat is helping and she's helping by being a cat and demanding to go in and out of the room, which I'm not a fan of because I want my door closed. So there we go. Fun. All right. So speaking of fun, just a segue I could put literally anywhere in this video uh, because I, I personally find geology to be just entirely too much fun. Um, but the top 10 reasons to be a geologist. Number 10, you can pronounce the word molybdenite, which is a bit of a tricky word to say, right? So molybdenite. Great. Pal did it. We'll talk about Pal in a little bit, but who I'm talking about right now, it's George Wesley Pal, who is sort of the father of modern geology and also kind of legitimately awesome uh, in his own right. You can make Indiana Jones look like a bit of a klutzy wuss. This is a true story from field camp. Now, if you remember back to our second slide and you saw a picture of Clarissa, and you'll notice that Clarissa is not exactly thin. I'm a fat kid. I've always been a fat kid. Uh, there's a strong correlation, actually, between autism and weight problems. Um, and I fit right within that demographic. So, um, but anyways, field camp is basically anywhere from a month to two months of hiking with a clipboard and all of your food and water strapped to your back. Um, it, it's kind of miserable. It's a little bit of low grade hazing and it's the capstone to any science geology degree. Um, so we were out in Dillon, Montana. We were map, was it Dillon? It was Dillon. Um, we were mapping these rocks and my partner who was just like, the green giant he was entirely too tall and i am five foot six at best and we got into this little culvert and we really couldn't get down the same way we came in and the only way out there was this tree branch sticking out like this old tree sticking out and my partner being you know basically gumby just grabbed the branch and swung down with his big long legs and his big long arms me, who possesses neither of those things, was like, I'm going to die trying to do that. I will absolutely break an ankle. So I pulled my belt off and swung down, screaming, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. But my fat butt was doing that. And Indiana Jones has all his fancy tools and he's much thinner. Okay, when he's old. But anyways, dinosaurs, seriously. If you want to study dinosaurs, this is the place to do it. Right? You want Jurassic Park to happen? Come play with us. It's okay. I'm a geologist. We'll actually get you into a lot of places, which is pretty funny. Mary, there's a nice kitty. Go. Out of the room. We're not doing this. Cats. All right, all you cool cats and kittens. I've never actually seen that show, incidentally. Um, but so two stories related to this particular comment. Um, one was my own and one was not. The one that was my own was more recent. And this was in Pullman, actually. There was a flood. And when isn't there a flood? There was a big flood. It was like a 50-year flood. It was big. Um, and they had closed off some sections of walkways in the park because the water was over the walkway. And they had, you know, police hanging out around him. And I walked up to one of the barricades and he says, oh, you can't go in there. And I looked at him and I went, oh, it's okay. I'm a geologist. And he just kind of shrugged. And so I got to go into where I probably shouldn't have been, but you know, I know what I'm doing. Uh, the other one that was significantly more funny to me, and I told this to my brother who was a Marine and he just kind of shook his head, but there was a large earthquake down in Utah, a group of students and professors in vans and they pull up to the National Guard step here, you know, stop outside and National Guide says, oh, you know, it's not safe, whatever, whatever. And Professor, oh, it's okay, we're geologists, and the National Guard just let them in. 
go play around on an old earthquake. I mean, it was, it was a big quake too. It was pretty cool. Well, okay, probably not cool to the people who live there, but as an earth scientist, like, I get excited about that crap. So, uh, no goggle marks. And this is legitimately, like, a good reason to think about geology. If you like science, but you hate goggles, the only time we typically use them is to keep rock chips out of our eyes when we're crushing or cutting them. But most of the time, we don't need them, right? You don't have to mess with squishy, gross, dead things. Oh my gosh. The dead things we deal with have all been dead for like a million years, so they don't smell bad anymore. They're not slimy, um, and they're just, yeah, no, not gross. You can laugh at the people who said you'd never be a rock star. And then I can start thinking about that, I want to say pink song. Oh, yeah. I'm not singing. Common activities, and this is 100% serious, include playing in the dirt, hiking, and coloring in the lines. Something my six-year-old really struggles with. He's just so impatient. Finally, travel all over the world and get paid to do it. So, it, and another thing that's really kind of nifty is geology is not just about Earth. You have, you know, exogeology. You have things going on all over in the universe. And between us and the astrophysicists, we sort of have this, like, relationship where we study together and we have a lot of fun with each other especially here at WSU and U of I um, in Moscow Pullman area this is like we have a great connection I feel like we do anyways um, so here's an example I want to say this is the Opportunity Rover which was landed on Mars and you know with training you can look at this picture and see a lot of really interesting things like um you know you see how these are all sort of triangular going that direction that might be a vent effect there's another one kind of going the same direction so we see the impact of some of the things going on in there um just from looking at this picture this is the t first time they found ice on mars i cannot remember if this is dry ice or if this is actually water ice but i know that there is all sorts of evidence for water ice um, the other thing that's kind of cool about this image is the fact that it's so red, which tells us there was oxygen at one point, lots of free oxygen, because it did that. Now, before we really start talking about the science itself, we have to start with the scientific method, which is possibly the most important thing you can learn from this entire video series, or any class in science you take, is the terminology and the process of the scientific method and this will make you quite honestly a better member of society and considering our current pandemic i think everybody on the planet needs to understand this and maybe be beaten about the head and shoulders with it a couple of times because really guys <sighs> anyways metaphorically not really so in the scientific method or in science in general we use a lot of terms like hypothesis or theory or scientific model what you'll notice is not in there is there is no law. No, 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 no. Because you can never prove anything. Scientifically speaking, you can only disprove something. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So the way the process is supposed to work is you see something and you think, huh, I wonder if this is because of that. That's your hypothesis. A hypothesis is an idea that is not tested, but that you're going to test, that you're going to challenge, and you're going to see if you can disprove this idea. And so we go through our testing. We have our challenges, right? We test, we test, we test. And if it is supported many, 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 many times, then we can move it on and call it a theory. But it's very rare to really, you know, have new theories. Um, we don't come up with them as often as it seems like everybody wants to think. Um, so anytime somebody's like, do you want to hear my theory about X? And I'm like, no, but I'll listen to your hypothesis about X because you haven't tested that, I guarantee. Um, you're just, you know speculating which great that was the foundation of science you know the philosophers but it's not all there is to it right so the really important difference between a hypothesis buggers and a theory is testing and that is huge 
we test and test and test. One of the things that's really important in science is that we are really aggressive about disproving ourselves. Like we want to be wrong and we don't really, but we want to prove ourselves wrong. And that's the mindset you go in with. And then if you fail at that, you're like, yay, keep going. Now, scientific models are sort of a category in and of themselves. They are typically mathematical. And they explain a they explain a very specific function. So you might use um, a scientific model would be the theory of relativity. E equals the MC squared, right? So E equals MC squared. That's a scientific model because math. It's math, right? Um, and these can also be challenged, but it's a little bit less common that they actually fail the tests. Anyways, so the important thing and the thing that I harp on and harp on and harp on is if it hasn't been tested rigorously, it is not a theory. It is a hypothesis. Unless there's math. So one example, we'll do a couple of these examples because they're funny to me, right? We see the sun, you know, here's the sky and here's the sun. And it goes across the sky every day, right? So why is that? There have been many, many proposed hypotheses um, that Apollo, the god of the sun, was riding his chariot across the sky every day. Um, potentially one major hypothesis, and this was really universal in a lot of places, was that the earth sits still and everything else is revolving around us. I'm just going to not even, not even, and there's so much snark that could be assigned to that. Um, anyways. And this was called the geocentric belief. Geo being earth centric. The earth is the center of everything. Um, but when they started applying precise mathematics and careful measurements, and this was very common, especially in the Greeks, actually, and the Chinese um, had very careful documentation of this. They realized that that didn't really work. Right. I mean, this just doesn't work. The earth in the middle of everything and the sun and the moon and everything else is just revolving around us. Like, why would you think that? But I mean, there are reasons. I'll leave them alone. But what we realized eventually is that was not the case. But in fact, we were moving around the sun and it was our planet's rotation of and in itself that caused the sun to appear to move across to the sky. So it was more about perspective. Um, and that's called the heliocentric, uh, the heliocentric model. So heliocentric model of the solar system. Uh, because the sun or helios is in the middle. We'll get into why that's funny later. So here's another question we might ask. Does a glacier move? And one of the ways we might tell, I mean, are you going to sit out there with a radar gun? No, it's cold. But one of the ways that we were actually able to determine this was by placing markers on the glacier. And so, in, you know, here's the example is in 1874, they placed them in a straight line. And over time, you know, those stakes moved and you could see. So now here's the question for you. Where is the glacier moving the fastest? Just based on this picture, what would be your guess? Right? Do, 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 do. Eh. Okay, so the answer is obviously right in the middle, right? Because that's where it's gone the furthest. So that's the fastest moving part of the glacier. When we talk about glaciers in general, we'll use all the big terms. So here's our test. We had an observation. We thought the glacier might move. So then we started to, and that was our hypothesis. Hypothesis, glacier moves. I can't write. My handwriting is atrocious. I'm not sorry. Um, and we tested that. And our testing did not disprove our hypothesis. And so eventually it moved on to be a theory. And we talk about them the way we talk about rivers. Um, another hypothesis, and this is one that I think more people are interested in. <sighs> this is what it is. Is the KT, which is Cretaceous Tertiary, extinction which happened 65.5-ish million years ago. What's important about that one was it is the uh, extinction of the dinosaurs. That's why everybody cares. Excuse me. So 
we think that it had to be something fairly impactful. Something big had to happen because the die-off is pretty severe. It's not the most severe one. There's actually a more severe one for the back, but we'll get to that. Anyways, so we start looking for evidence of what killed the dinosaurs, right? I mean, it's a big question. Um, we, and we found some things. We found an impact structure from a very large meteor called the Chicxulub impact structure. Um, and this is down in the Gulf of Mexico. You can look it up. It's actually pretty cool. Um, they've got all sorts of imaging and, and we'll look at those pictures much later on in the series. But, um, and there was also a layer of this element called iridium. And if anybody's watched the original Avengers, you know that iridium really isn't an element that's common on the planet for reasons, but is brought in on asteroids occasionally on large enough bolides and bolides, by the way, I'll write it up here is a kind of a catch all term for asteroids, meteors, comets. Basically, if it comes in and smacks the planet, it's a bolide. Um, and because I struggle keeping some of those terms straight, um, I like to use the term bo bolides more often. Um, and so these, you know, extraterrestrial impactors leave your iridium and there is a layer at approximately, it's a little bit off, approximately the right time frame for this KT impact. So we know that this happened, that a meteor hit and it hit at roughly the right time. So there's some testing that we've done now. We've looked for and found something that would be the spot that it hit. And we found evidence of the impact in other places. There's also this thing called tectites. I'm going to spell it wrong, I think. Yeah, it's probably misspelled. But, um, and they are little blobs of molten rock that got flung like continents away by this impact. Um, the, what happened with this incidentally with Chicxulub was when it hit in the Gulf of Mexico, it caused a lot of the sediments on the bottom, which contained a lot of sulfur to aerosolize and block a lot of the sunlight. So you saw a lot of die-offs, but it wasn't the only thing going on at the time. There was also a very, very, very large volcanic event going on at roughly the same time. And between the two of them, it's just it, nothing was going to save the dinosaurs at this point. Um, the Deccan Traps were a volcanic province in India. Um, we'll talk more about these large volcanic provinces like this. But the closest corollary in the U.S. is the Columbia River flood basalts. And the Columbia River flood basalts are my forte. That's like what I specialize in. And the whole total of the CRBs produce 250-ish thousand cubic kilometers of erupted material. Now, to put that into perspective, that means that there was so much lava that if we covered the entire United States, not counting Alaska and Hawaii, sorry guys, I know Hawaii, you don't want to be here anyways, I don't blame you, uh, covered the whole thing 50 feet deep in lava. That was the CRBs. And in terms of flood basalts, that's like tiny little baby province because the deckhands were twice that big. So we had enough lava coming out at the same time to cover the U.S. in 100 feet of lava across the board. Um, at the same time that this big bolide's also hitting. So, I mean, th there's no way it's not going to have a profound impact. Um, the basalts are releasing their own cocktail of gases and it causes some pretty big damage. But so that's our scientific method. So theory of plate tectonics, another theory that we have in geology. I'm brain dead. We use our scientific models mathematically. Again, math. We can calculate the attraction a given particle based on its mass is going to have to another and we can test it too i mean we can show that those calculations are correct the theory of plate tectonics is a mechanism but it doesn't necessarily include the calculations although we do have models that go along with it um so now we're going to kind of take a little bit of a divergent jag usually i do like a, a break in between these so this would not be one lecture but this is the entire first set of slides. And so it's like one topic and then we'll move into the next topic. So, um, we're going to sort of start with the beginning of time now 
and move forwards into the formation of the earth um, and then go from there. So one thing that's really important to understand is this thing called the Doppler effect. And you've experienced this. If you've ever sat at a train crossing, you've experienced the Doppler effect with sound. As an item moves, the faster it moves, obviously, the more this is going to happen. Sound and light, which both function as waves, are going to either be compressed if it's moving towards you or extended if you're moving away. So if you imagine that train crossing and you sit and you listen to it and you hear the sound, right? So it's higher pitched and then as it passes you, the sound drops and becomes much lower. And that's the Doppler effect because high pitched sounds have a higher frequency. Not that kind of high. So high pitched sounds are going to have the tighter frequency and the extended ones are going to have a lower frequency. It's going to be your lower pitches. There's less energy involved as well. Color, it's kind of the same thing. Blue has a really, really high frequency as does purple, which is the fastest. Um, and then it moves up into ultraviolet and then red is our lowest frequency. So you can see here, there's a lot more space between the individual peaks and troughs. It's much shorter. That's our wavelength. Um, so we look at these. Now light will be susceptible this, to this as well. If you have a light source that is moving away from you at sufficient speeds, and it does have to be relatively fast, but on galactic scales, that's not hard to do. Um, it's going to shift and it's going to turn more red if it's moving away from us and blue if it's coming towards us. So when we look out across the galaxy, we see the same thing. We see everything shifting red a little bit. Everything. All of the stars, all the planets. So what we're seeing is that the universe is actually expanding because it's moving away from us. And this is where the Big Bang Theory, not the show, <laughs> Sheldon, has no appreciation for good science. He's way too focused on, like, one thing. It's just not healthy. Anyways, <laughs> if you can't tell, I found the whole geology textbook thing kind of offensive and poop on him. So, all matter and energy was concentrated into one single dense point that was sort of, what was it that Jenkins said? So before time, there was, or before space, there was still time, but space was all compressed down, right? Um, I'll have to look the quote up later. But about 14 billion years ago, the expansion began, and we don't know what triggered it. We don't know what came before. I have a hypothesis um, that I'll get into at another time. But the universe began to expand at that point, and it's still expanding today. And we can see that through looking at those shifts in color from these stars where we know they should be this color based on their spectrums, um, which tells us what elements are within them. And yet they're coming in slightly more red than we expect. So it explains a lot. Now, why we care about this, why the Big Bang is important is because it is one of those unifying concepts. Um, it explains the age of the universe, the age of the earth. And it also helps set the stage for the creation of all of the elements. And we have four types of elemental formation or nucleosynthesis. Uh, they are cosmological, stellar, explosive, and cosmic ray spallation. Um, cosmic nucleosynthesis is the Big Bang, Big Bang itself, which formed a limited number of isotopes or elements. So in the beginning, immediately following the Big Bang, it was way too hot and energy was too high for matter to exist. So it took a while for things to cool down. And at that point, and this was about 14 billion years ago again, and I use that number for a reason because we're going to do some math in a minute um, and that'll help explain it. But really all we had form in the beginning was this little guy, right? Hydrogen. We had some helium and a little bit of lithium. Because we've got two orbitals here. 
So all very small. So we have one proton, two protons, three protons. Everything is very small. And one of the reasons for that probably is that what do opposites do? Opposites attract. Like particles repel each other. So it's hard to get protons because they both have the same charge to stick together. We need something more. What's more than the Big Bang, you ask? You'll see. So originally we have these areas of space that are just cosmic dust, basically initially hydrogen and helium gas, just sort of floating around in the vast emptiness of the void, which wasn't so vast or empty at the time because it was still fairly compressed down. But we're expanding. So these clouds of dust, every particle in that has gravity, right? Every particle of everything, all matter has gravity. And gravity is just the attraction of matter to itself. And then some things have magnetics, which similar concept, but more subtle. So these things are going to start clumping together more and more and more. And as, you know, they start sticking together or at least sticking close to each other, they develop more gravity. And so then more things are going to be pulled in and more and more and more. And they get a further and further reach. So after the initial Big Bang, the universe continued to expand and matter came together to form galaxies and stars, which was through gravitational attraction. Over time, the hydrogen clumped into balls that eventually formed the first generation of stars which is really freaking cool. So one thing that's really important to note is that stars, the sun, they're not actually burning. This is our stellar nucleosynthesis. And this happens, and I, it's a shame that I can't figure out how to like make this have video, but um, of me as well, because we always do these hand gestures as geologists and I'm doing them and you can't see it, which is a shame. But so this hydrogen, you know, it starts sticking around together. Once enough of it starts sticking together, it has enough gravity that the balls of hydrogen or the atoms themselves are being smashed into each other. And they hit so hard because the gravity is so high. And that's what makes stars special is that they have so much gravity that they are forcing this process and it's a process you've heard of before called nuclear fusion, right? Because two elements are fusing together and producing another element. And if you remember this equation, E equals MC squared, we know that this mass converting into energy produces a ton of energy, stupid amounts of energy, right? Most commonly we were looking at, we're looking at helium smashing, helium being formed by the smashing together of hydrogens. Sometimes once you get down into what's called helium burning, then you start forming carbon. This is stellar nucleosynthesis. So stellar nucleosynthesis is the formation of new elements inside of stars. Stellar, stella, stars, that, that's where it comes from. Eventually, the hydrogen all gets used up. If the star is small, they will convert into later phases and then sort of shrink down in on themselves and just sort of smolder. Um, and then it's sort of a gravity versus electron repulsion question and they'll just sit there. Um, there's a model for that. You can do the math and I'm not a fan. Bigger stars though, when the larger stars finally hit the end of their hydrogen cycles and they've burned through everything else, I say burned and I don't mean burned, but they fused everything else as much as they can. They reach a point where the gravitational attraction is not enough to overcome the electron repulsion. And so they explode. Um, the biggest, the bigger stars, like moderately big, and our sun is really quite small. Um, it's <laughs> cosmologically unremarkable. When that happens, we get a thing called a nova. And if it's a really big element, a big star, like the biggest stars, then you get a supernova. So we have our cosmological nucleosynthesis, which is the formation during the Big Bang. That's where some of our elements came from when we got lithium, hydrogen, helium. Stellar nucleosynthesis will give us elements up to iron. 
And then once you get past iron on the periodic table, you need explosive nucleosynthesis. Novas will give us iron um, and some of the other heavy elements, but the really heavy elements like gold and uranium only form when supernovas happen, which is so freaking cool, right? Like my wedding ring came from a supernova. Awesome. So remember universe 14 billion years old, 4 billion, 4.6 billion years ago, a star formed in a nebula like this. And that star became our, yeah, whatever. So anyways, nebula formed and first I'm going to play a game because I think this is funny. So we're looking at this thing where we're going, okay, silicon through iron formed through novas. Everything heavier than iron, supernovas. Those elements exist on this planet. So those are our observations, right? We're making these observations. Our sun is 4.6 billion years old and the universe is 14-ish billion years old. So what are some hypotheses we could come up from, you know, come up with from this? Well, the first one that I think is the most obvious is that our sun is the second round of stars. Like we had to have an entire galaxy of stars that happened and died before our sun formed for our planet to exist the way that it does with the elements that it does. And we need those elements. A lot of those metals are absolutely critical to life. Iron, for example, is in our blood, right? Hugely important. So we can come up with some hypotheses based on this that maybe the sun cycle is about 10 billion years. I mean, that's something that could reasonably be guessed. And then we would want to go and look for evidence to test that and come up with a theory. Anyways, so we have a cloud of gases that includes all of the elements that we know of. And they are floating there in space, being attracted to one another through gravity. Now, one thing to keep in mind is because of reasons I'm not going to get into because it's really complicated, but all matter has an inherent spin at a molecular level. And because of that, these nebular disks have a tendency to rotate like a pizza crust. And as the nebula starts to collapse in on itself, starts to form the sun or the star in the middle of it, it's going to spin faster because there's more inertia. There's more mass that's spinning. You get the idea. Eventually, it flattens out, like I said, like a pizza crust into a bit of a disc with the sun at the center. Once the sun ignites, so there's our sun at the center, right? The dump, the dust, the dust forms these planetesimals first before they form planets, before stars and stuff. You get these little planetesimals. And over time, they're going to smash into each other more and more and more. And when they do that, and if you, you know, clap your hands 20, 30 times, your hands are going to start warming up. Now imagine two city-sized chunks of rock smashing into each other. There's a lot of kinetic energy that gets converted into heat. So these things can start to fuse together as they get bigger and start hitting faster and faster. So you start with a nebular cloud. The concentration towards the middle starts to happen. We start getting the big spin and the flattening. Then once we get the planetesimals, it's just a matter of them sweeping their orbits and forming one body, right? So eventually things tend to form into a solar system where you have a mostly steady planetary plane. And of course, it doesn't look anything like this. It's very oblique, but... Um, it's much more organized. All of these planets have swept their orbit of any other sizable bodies. That's why Pluto isn't. We'll get into that one later. Um, poor Pluto. Anyways. So the Earth and other planets. Now this is really, I love this part and this slide because it's super cool. So we have four planets on the inside of the asteroid belt, four planets on the outside, and then Pluto. Right, which is sort of its own special case, even by these definitions that we're going to use here. So what's the difference between these two groupings? The first group, the four inner planets, are what we refer to as the rocky or terrestrial planets. And they have, you know, a solid core. We're mostly solid with a very thin atmosphere around us. The outer planets are called the Jovian planets or gas giants, right? 
That's a term we've all heard before. They are very, very large and they contain a lot of gases. And then in between those two blocks, we have an asteroid belt. Pluto's like ice. Pluto's special. Um, and we'll get to that, like I said. But so why is this? It's really, it's so cool why this is organized this way. So remember that disc, right? We had that nebular disc and in the middle was the sun. And that sun, once it starts to actually produce fusing elements, when it starts to burn, as we say, it also starts producing kind of a, a solar wind, right? And there is this wind pushing out away from it everywhere. Now, if you take in your hand, a handful of gravel that's mixed with some sand and some flour, perhaps, and you blow on that, what's going to move? The lightest weight material, because inertia is a thing, right? So the lightest materials, when the sun first kicked off and started to blow outwards, the lighter materials were pushed out away from the center of the disk. Each of these gas giants has, oops, not what we wanted, has at its core a little planet like us. The difference is the atmosphere on these planets is insane, right? It's much, much, much larger. Jupiter is so big, in fact, that it prevented the formation of another planet here where the asteroid belt is because these planetesimals and asteroids smash into each other but when they get close enough to Jupiter they smash into each other too hard and they break apart instead of sticking together so that's why there's an asteroid belt there there could have been another planet there but Jupiter messed it up shame on them Pluto is special in its own right for a number of reasons um, it's made of ice right? It's really, 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 really small out there. But the reason that it's not considered a planet is twofold. The first is that it has not swept its orbit of all large bodies. They haven't all come together. But the more important one is it isn't the center of its own gravity. And what I mean by that is if you have the earth, right? And here's our gravity center is the middle of the earth. And our moon rotates around that center pole. Pluto's moon doesn't do that. Pluto, which isn't even fully sphere, and Charon orbit a point. So its orbit is more like that. They orbit each other. Um, and because it is not the center of its own gravity, that's why it's classed as a dwarf planet as opposed to a planet. There are actually reasons we were just picking on it. Now, the Earth itself is roughly 4.5 billion years old. So about a billion years after the sun kicked off, we were sort of, well, not a billion, sorry, 100 million years. After the sun kicked off, we were starting to form as a planet. Like I said, we have these planetesimals and chunks that are attracted to each other by gravity and they smash into each other. And we have evidence that occurs to this day, right? Anytime you want to go out and watch the Perseid meteor shower or any of the others, we can see meteors and chunks of rocks and things, bolides, if you will, coming in. Um, here's an example of one out in Arizona. I saw a meme that made me go, oh, for the love of all that is not painful. Um, somebody said, wow, it's a miracle. The uh, visitor center is so close to where the asteroid hit. It's a good thing it didn't hit the visitor center. Oh, honey, it's not how this works. This is a very old impact structure out here. Um, so why doesn't the Earth look like this? Lots of reasons. Um, we, For one, we have an atmosphere, right? And that's what we see here when we see the meteors burning up as they come in through the atmosphere. Um, that's one of the reasons we don't have as many bullet impacts on the, on the planet. Um, but... The other reason is we have weather, right? And the wind and the rain wear this stuff down. And then we also have plate tectonics, which builds mountains and changes the way the surface of the Earth is. So early on in the formation of the Earth, we're impacting with lots of other large bodies. Every time we hit it, we get more heat. And then additionally, radioactive elements like uranium are producing a lot of heat as well. And it's actually a fairly significant contribution to the internal heat engine, the radioactive decay. 
this causes the earth to be not liquid, but more liquid. And things that are heavier than others are going to sink. And as they sink, you know, the lighter things are going to rise up. And if you do oil and water, right, you mix them together, you can see this happening where the oil floats up and the water sinks to the bottom. And that's because the oil has less density. It weighs less per volume. This is a process called differentiation. Now, density is just the relationship between the size and the mass of an object, or its weight, if you want to use that term, but it's not really accurate. Um, it's expressed as rho, and it's calculated as grams over cubic centimeters or milliliters. If the object is denser than the fluid, it will displace it and sink. And if the object is lighter than the fluid it's in, it's going to float. That would be like a piece of styrofoam. If you put it in water, push it down, you let it go, it's going to pop back up, right? It don't want to sink. So the earth is very hot and the very heavier materials, the heaviest materials that are very abundant, sink down to the bottom. They sink to the middle of the planet and create what we call the core. While the lighter, less dense materials, kind of like the, the bubbles, foam and stuff, the foamy scummy stuff, floats up to the top. And that gives us the crust, and that's our surface area. Uh, our structure of the planet is chemically segregated because of this process of differentiation. Um, and we have three main distinct you know, units, the core, the mantle, and the crust. The core, just like the core on an apple, and incidentally, I love that movie, The Core. Um, for all it's like Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, Pigeons, whatever. Um, we have an inner core and an outer core, and this is a time I'm going to introduce a term that I'm going to use a lot, and that is temperature always loses, loses to pressure. Oh, I always write off the screen, pressure. Or pressure trumps temp. In terms of earth materials, the pressure is always going to win out over the temperature. Um, so our inner core, because it is relatively similar in temperature to the liquid outer core, but under so much more pressure is actually a solid. So we have a solid inner core surrounded by the liquid outer core, which of course the scientists on the unobtainium ship have to fire off a nuclear missile, wait, several nuclear bombs, that's what it was, inside the uh, liquid outer core to cause it to start spinning again to save humanity. Don't know if that was a good idea, but whatever. Our crust has two different types, continental and oceanic. Our mantle is also broken into two different sections, the upper and lower mantle, and we'll look at that a little bit more um, in just a minute. The crust compositional variations are one of the more important ones. Um, the core one is also really important because the spinning of the liquid outer core is what gives us our electro, excuse me, electromagnetic um, field that protects us from solar radiation. Like it's vital to us surviving. So the premise of the movie isn't actually terrible. It's just silly the way that it's done, right? because hand waving um and the content of the crustal differences determine where we're going to have continents and where we're going to have oceans obviously so now as to the formation of the moon possibly my favorite story in the entire beginning of the earth at some point during the very late stages of our planet's formation a large mars side body um its name was thea hit the planet and it was kind of like the fights like fight club when uh, the guy punches another guy and his head kind of snaps to the side and you got blood and teeth flying everywhere only it was a planet that smacked another planet so the planet earth got tilted a little to the side and then some chunks of it as well as chunks of thea kind of came back together What's interesting to note, though, is that when Thea hit us, it, and this was very fast, look at the timeline on this, this is like hours that this was happened over, 
the core from Thea partially got dropped into Earth, which means our electromagnetic field is actually a little bit bigger than it would have been normally um, and a little bit stronger, which may play into, you know, our viability. But all of those parts came back together and formed the moon orbiting our planet. That's where it came from. This did a number of things in addition to the formation of the moon. It sped up the Earth's rotation. Um, and the Earth has been slowing down from that ever since. Um, and it gave us our orbital tilt. And that is what is responsible for seasons. And the moon itself, of course, is responsible for tides. And all of that is why we have life on this planet to begin with. It's really very delicate. Now, one of the ways we know about these layers is by looking at different meteors because we know that there were planets before our planet. And they had these layers. I mean, it's, it's sort of a... The geophysics people can talk about this for days. I find it a bit dry. But anyways, so we get three common types of meteors. We actually find these separate types, usually in Antarctica. Um, the iron and nickel meteors are basically what you would find in the core. So that's the heart of a planet. We get stony meteors, which have a lot of olivine in them, which is a really cool mineral. Um, and these are typically representative of the mantle. And then our carbonaceous conondrites that have a lot of carbon in them are going to be representative of the crust. So here we have a what we call a palisite, which is somewhere in between a stony and an iron meteor. And so and so here we've got the stony parts right here, right? And then the iron or the metallic parts there. This represents the transition zone between the crust and the mantle. All the meteorites we find, essentially they're the exact same age, four and a half to 4.3 billion years old. It tells us a lot about, you know, the source of our planet. We know that these were part of the same sort of cloud that formed our planet. So they are samples of what's going on where we can't get to them. So the earth is hot. We have these layers. We have the crust, the mantle, the core, are two different types of cores, differentiated only because the pressure is higher on one and so it becomes a solid and the outer core is a liquid and able to move giving us our magnetic field. The mantle is where a lot of action takes place. Now there are a lot of other spheres in the planet that we don't really talk about when we come outside of the surface of the earth right the atmosphere the hydrosphere biosphere um, cryosphere that sort of stuff we don't really touch on very much um, and that's for this reason. So the Earth is a system that has two energy sources, two heat sources, really, right? You have the external heat engine, which is solar energy from the sun. And in terms of life, that is far and away the most important energy source, right? It runs our biosphere, it runs our hydrosphere, it runs climate and weather and everything, right? But if you go to the beach, this was always my favorite thing. You go to the beach and it's really, really hot on the surface, right? So what do you do to keep your feet from getting too hot? You kind of wiggle them down. And it only takes, you know, a couple centimeters, a couple inches down before you hit cold sand, right? And that's just an example of the fact that the solar energy does not really penetrate the ground very far. So anything that's happening tectonically has to be driven by heat from the internal heat engine. And that was the heat energy that was created, by and large, through that planetesimal bombardment where all of the little guys were smashing into each other. So we have all of that leftover heat that's been trapped inside this blanket of crust. And then there's also the radioactive elemental decay within the Earth. So we have these two. And these guys mostly affect only, you know, the lithospheric type things, the ethosphenosphere, so the inner parts. But... Without the tectonics, we don't have anything to live on, right? So life doesn't exist. Well, okay, that's not entirely true, but it, it's critical for getting a lot of the elements that we need out. Initially, we didn't really have an atmosphere because it was just too bloody hot. And the solar winds were very intense. They were blowing everything away. So initially, we didn't really have anything because the helium and the hydrogen were taken off all on their own. And... Uh, they just didn't look the ground. Screw you guys. We're going home. Where is it? There we go. But over time, during what we call the heavy late drop bombardment, 
There were or late heavy bombardment. I can never keep straight. We had a lot of meteors still coming in, still bringing in water and all these other what we call gases like nitrogen, carbon gases, water, that sort of stuff. We're coming in on meteors, but a lot of them were also coming out from the ground. So we had all of these volatiles that were tied up initially. And as they percolate up, they're going to be released out into the atmosphere over time. And this kind of happened all at one time across the planet. And they called that the big burp, where all of these gases were coming out. And so here's an example. We love this. This is a volcano exploding. And there are a lot of gases that come out from this. Um, the story of Frankenstein actually is the result of the gases that came out of these volcanoes. And I'll get to why that is later on. It's pretty funny. I got lots of stories. So the earth was really, really, really hot, but eventually it cooled down. And when it did, the water vapor that was in the atmosphere began to condense and fell as rain. Now, one of the things that's important to note about density and the crust is we have two types of crust. We have a continental crust, which tends to be quite thick. And the continental crust is also lighter weight. So it tends to bob a little bit higher in the mantle, kind of like a piece of cork, as opposed to a piece of oak, which is quite dense, right? The oceanic crust, this basaltic oceanic crust, is thin and heavy, and it tends to sit a little bit lower. So if we have a situation like that and rain is falling, you know, on everything, it's going to run off into the basins. That's what our oceans are, which is why we call it oceanic crust. <laughs> Geology is the triumph of terminology over common sense. I'll say that a lot. It was something one of my professors said. But we've got the water runs downhill and it pools in the oceans. Now we can use the scientific method. One of the things that we like to do is to look at these processes that are occurring on the earth and try and figure out how they happened. And then we can look at the processes that are happening now and try and figure out how they apply to the past. So if you go to Lake Hawaii and you're watching the lava flows, there'll be lava flows that enter the ocean. And that's what we're looking at here on the left. We have these little individual lobes or toes. Here's one. Here's one, right? There's probably another one down underneath here. As the lava comes out, it makes little pockets, it expands, and then another one forms and it's mesmerizing and you should watch it. Watch videos of this because it's so cool. Um, but then we can look at these and look at, say, an 8 million year old outcrop of this, like at Sand Hollow, um, and say, oh, 8 million years ago, this over here on the left is what was happening to form this. And now it's out above water um, and still doing that. Now, when things really started to kind of come into what we consider modern geology, and this was even before uh, Powell, was James Hutton. And he proposed this concept of uniformitarianism. The other version of, you know, how things happen in the universe, they called catastrophism. Um, and that came about a little bit earlier with Usher and Cuvier. Um, but Hutton said, no, it's not that everything on the planet is always changing through catastrophes, but through constant, slow, steady processes that are ongoing to this day. And that was one of the key words there. We say the present is the key to the past and the past is the key to the future. So we look at, you know, all of these things and we can apply those processes, both future and present and past. So here's an example of uniformitarianism. This is a process that people are probably pretty familiar with. This is in the desert, obviously, and we get this all the time. Um, mud cracks. And these are just Places where you had, and this used to happen on my driveway all the time, right? Or in the backyard where you had a muddy puddle, the water has evaporated and the raw, the dirt eventually forms this little like snakeskin sort of scaly pattern to it. And these are defined as polygonal patterns of cracks that develop in mud as it dries. So if we look at this situation, we're looking at a mud flat. So this is an area that got some rain and then it evaporated off. So probably a desert area, right? So what if we find... So mud flats or other areas exposed to wet dry cycles. This is in the high desert. Um, 
But now we look at some rocks that are two billion years old. And you have the exact same thing going on. So we have preserved mud cracks that were formed through the same process two billion years ago. The present is the key to the past. So that's the principle of uniformitarianism. And it's really, really critical like in the geosciences because it helps us time things out. I mean, just all sorts of stuff. So the last thing we're going to talk about in this video and uh, before I go and try and pretend I know what I'm doing with editing, which incidentally I don't. Um, so I think I'm probably going to leave most of it just exactly as it is. But whatever. There are three main types of rocks. Igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. And each one formed through a different process. Igneous rocks, by far and away my favorite, are formed from the solidification of melted rock. So we have rock that is in a liquid form that cools back down. And either we can have the volcano doing its thing, right? Or in the plumbing system down below where we have our magma chamber, right? So we can have our cooling in the Earth's crust or our volcanoes. Good times, good times. Sedimentary rocks are fragments of other rocks that have broken down, so sand, pebbles, um, and also the product of dissolution, so ions dissolved in water um, that eventually solidify into rocks. So here's prime example. This is the Grand Canyon. Um, and what's really interesting to notice, there's a big elevation difference between the two rims, but, and you have these different layers here of rocks where you've got slopes and then you've got cliffs and then you've got more slopes and different color changes. And these are all sedimentary rocks. So these are bits of other rocks that were broken down and have come back together. And then finally, metamorphic rocks, which are rocks that have transformed through heat and pressure and the addition of like fluids like water without melting. And that's what's really important with metamorphic rocks is this is a solid state change. Most of these environments are deep underground, but there is one surface example and that's meteor impacts um, create a thing called shock metamorphism. Metamorphism. <clears throat> um, here's an example of a metamorphosed rock. You can see how the, the whole thing has gotten almost plasticky and bent. It was pretty nifty. So that's all I have to say. Hopefully everybody has just all sorts of fun with that. Later, taters.